Say, those brakes really work. I just stepped on them normal like and... Power brakes, my boy. I forgot to tell you. With power brakes, you stop faster with less effort. Say, why don't I tell you all about these brakes when we get to work? Now, this is the power unit, Wes. Suppose Hold I... Hold it a minute, Hal. Here's Tech. Hiya, boys. Looks like I'm just in time. Are you going to tell Wes about that power brake unit? I sure am, Tech, and I'm glad to see you. <laughs> you don't mind if I put you to work, do you? Mine? Say, I do more work for you guys than oh, you do. Oh, brother. Here we go again. If this poser ever did a good day's work, I... All right, you two. Break it up. Oh, mamma mia. Break it up, he says. Get on with the brake story before you come up with any more of those puns. <laughs> well, I thought I'd start out by explaining the principles behind power brakes. Of course, we all know that the power brake unit assists or boosts the hydraulic pressure applied to the wheel cylinders when the brakes are applied. Yeah, I know. But how does it furnish this boost? By using a combination of engine vacuum and air at atmospheric pressure, Wes. I'll explain in a minute. Then the big advantage, as I see it, is that the driver can apply more force at the wheel cylinders without having to exert more pressure on the brake pedal, right? That's it, Wes. Actually, he can exert more force with less brake pedal pressure. You're both right. In fact, with power brakes, you can stop your car with about half the effort you'd need to stop it if it didn't have power brakes. You're familiar with the hydraulic brake master cylinder action, Wes. You'll remember that the movement of the brake pedal pushes the piston against a column of fluid in the lines to the wheel cylinders. Fluid pressure is equal to all wheel cylinders, Wes. To exert more pressure at the wheels, more force must be applied by the master cylinder piston. And this means more push on the brake pedal. Right. Now, if we install a power brake unit in the line between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinders, we get more braking with less effort. And this power brake unit is mounted on two frame side rail brackets beneath the driver's seat. The power brake unit consists of two basic assemblies. One is the diaphragm, power plate, push rod, and power piston assembly. This assembly is contained in the main housing and main cylinder. The other basic assembly of the power brake unit is called the valve housing and contains the control piston, the air valve, the vacuum valve, and the valve actuating plate. Now, we know that this unit works from a combination of engine vacuum and air at atmospheric pressure. The air and vacuum valves are the means by which either air or vacuum is admitted to one side of the diaphragm. These valves are assembled at the ends of the actuating plate. Movement of the valves is governed by the movement of the plate, which in turn is moved by the control piston. One side of the diaphragm is open to engine vacuum all the time the engine is running. The purpose of the vacuum valve is to allow vacuum to be admitted to or closed off from the other side of the diaphragm. When both sides of the diaphragm are open to engine vacuum, we say that the diaphragm is vacuum suspended. Now, the purpose of the air valve is to close off or admit air at atmospheric pressure to the cover side of the diaphragm. The power piston is assembled to the power plate of the diaphragm. The piston, as it's moved by the diaphragm, transmits pressure to the fluid in the cylinder and lines leading to the wheel cylinders. Now that we know what's inside the unit, Wes, Let's start with the driver pressing on the brake pedal and carry the story right on through the action of the braking system. But first, we better get something straight. The basic function of the two sections of the power brake unit. The main housing and main cylinder assembly form the power part of the power brake unit. It's here that the additional force of air pressure is transmitted to the hydraulic fluid as it goes to the wheel cylinders. Right. And the valve housing assembly furnishes the control. Its units control the admission of vacuum or air to the cover side of the diaphragm in the main housing in response to hydraulic signals received from the driver's foot as it depresses the brake pedal. 
And you want to keep in mind that the power brake unit is between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinders. So the hydraulic part of the unit contains brake fluid, just like the rest of the hydraulic system. You'll remember we said that in a car not equipped with a power brake unit, the driver furnished the power for applying the brakes through the master cylinder. But with the power brake unit in the system, he gets an assist. Right, and here's how he gets it. The hydraulic system is full of fluid. The fluid check valve in the power piston is being held off its seat by the tang on the trip plate. The fluid is not moving and is under practically no pressure. Now, let's see what happens when the driver wants to stop the car. First, he presses the brake pedal, which puts the hydraulic fluid in the system under pressure. The pressure causes the power piston to move to the right. This is a very slight movement, but is enough to draw the check valve ball away from the tang on the trip plate. This action permits the spring to seat the ball in the opening in the piston. As the ball seats, it isolates the primary or low pressure end of the control piston from the secondary or high pressure end of the piston, as far as hydraulic pressure is concerned. Now, as you can see, Fluid in the primary chamber can apply pressure only to the primary end of the control piston. And the fluid in the secondary chamber can exert pressure only on the secondary end of the control piston. Now, since the primary end of the control piston has a larger area than the secondary end, the hydraulic fluid pressure exerted at the primary end of the piston will move the piston from left to right. And as this control piston moves, it tilts the valve actuating plate, causing the air valve to open and the vacuum valve to close. Right, so vacuum on the cover side of the diaphragm is cut off, and air at atmospheric pressure is admitted to that side. I get it. This means that there is air at atmospheric pressure on the cover side of the diaphragm, and vacuum on the other side, right? That's it, Wes. And as this pressure overcomes the power piston return spring pressure, the push rod and power piston are moved to the right. And this action boosts the hydraulic pressure which is being applied to the brakes at the wheel cylinders. I get that all right. But what happens when I hold the brake pedal in the applied position after the initial brake pedal application? The system remains in what is called the poised position, Wes. With the pedal in the poised position, Fluid pressure on the primary end of the control piston remains constant, while the pressure on the secondary end of the piston increases slightly. Why does it increase, Hal? Because of the air pressure boost against the diaphragm, Wes. Now, this slight increase in pressure on the secondary end of the control piston causes the piston to move slightly toward the left or primary side. And this slight movement of the piston will tilt the valve actuating plate just enough to close the air valve, but not enough to cause the vacuum valve to open. That's it, Tech. As you can see, in this position, the slightest decrease in brake pedal pressure will move the control piston further to the primary side, opening the vacuum valve. Then you'd admit vacuum to replace the air on the cover side of the diaphragm, and that would decrease pressure at the wheel cylinders. And I suppose any slight increase in pedal pressure would move the control piston toward the secondary end and open the air valve. That would admit more air to the cover side of the diaphragm and increase the pressure at the wheel cylinders. That's it, Wes. You've got it now. Well, that about tells the story of how the power brake system works, Wes. You got any questions? You're just waiting for me to open my mouth so you can jump down my throat, aren't you? Who, me? Why, Wesley, you know I wouldn't do a thing like that to you. Not much you wouldn't. But I do have a couple of questions. Let's suppose that the power assist fails for some reason. Can the car be stopped without the power brake unit operating? It certainly can, Wes. You'll remember that we said the power brake unit simply gave the hydraulic system a boost. So without the boost supplied by the power brake unit, you'd simply have to apply a little more pedal pressure to stop the car. Well, suppose the engine stalls so there is no manifold vacuum. Would the power brake unit still supply a power boost? Yes, it would, Wes, and here's why. There's a check valve in the vacuum line to the intake manifold. The valve is there to prevent loss of vacuum within the main housing long enough to permit a few power applications. Well, I guess that answers my questions. What's the story on service diagnosis? Before you get diagnosis, Hal, 
Somebody better turn this record over. You'll find, Wes, that this power brake unit is remarkably free of trouble. In fact, there are only about three main conditions that can crop up aside from possible hose connection leaks. What are these three conditions, Hal? Here they are. A power unit that fails to boost when the brakes are applied, brakes not releasing properly when pressure is relieved, and loss of fluid. Let's cover them one at a time. Now, if the unit fails to boost, you'd naturally suspect that vacuum wasn't acting on the unit. So check for a rush of air through the power unit air cleaner. Yeah, I get it. Just like you'd check the rush of air through Tech's head. Look who's talking about air. The way the air rushes into that vacuum he calls a head. <laughs> okay, that's a point for both of you. Here's how you make that check. With the car on the hoist and the engine idling, pull down hard on the brake pedal from underneath the car. At the same time, listen for a rush of air through the air cleaner on the frame side rail. If no air is heard, disconnect the vacuum line at the power unit and check to see if there's vacuum at the end of the line. And suppose there isn't, then what? If there's no vacuum, it could be one of three things, Wes. It could be a loose connection where the line is connected to the engine, the line could be partially plugged, or the ball in the check valve at the intake manifold could be stuck. I get it. That means I'd have to fix the line or put in a new check valve. But suppose I had heard a rush of air. In that case, Wes, it's probably because the fluid check valve ball in the power piston isn't seating the way it should, or the seal on the piston is leaking, so you're not getting enough hydraulic pressure to the wheel cylinders. Which means that you'd have to take the unit out of the car and fix it on the bench. Right, Tech. You'd look for a distorted ball spring, or a spring that had been installed with the small end away from the ball. The small end of the spring must always be against the ball. I get it. The spring couldn't hold the ball on its seat. I suppose it's a good idea to clean up the valve and piston and replace any damaged parts at this time. That's a good point, Wes. Now, if you could hear air rushing somewhere when the engine's running and the pedal is not pulled down, you might have a leak in the air vacuum crossover line between the valve housing and the main housing. Or the gasket for the valve housing cover may be leaking. In that case, Wes, you'd have to take the unit off the car to replace the rubber hose or replace the valve housing assembly. I get that all right, Hal. What other conditions could we run into? There are a couple more conditions, Wes, but first, let's talk about brakes that won't release. We can make our check of this condition with the car on the hoist and the engine running. The first thing we do to check for the cause is to disconnect the hydraulic line between the master cylinder and the power unit. If the brakes release now, you can bet your bottom dollar the trouble isn't in the power unit, but in the master cylinder. And I know what to do in that case, Hal. But what if the brakes hadn't released? What would I do then? In this case, we disconnect the hydraulic line at the end of the power unit main cylinder. That's the one that leads to the wheel cylinders. If the brakes release then, the power unit's at fault. Would you have to remove the unit from the car to fix it? Whoa, hold on a minute. First, you'd check that screw in the cover near the mounting plate. That screw could be loose or missing and allow air to leak into the housing all the time, holding the brakes on. So you'd tighten it or put in a new screw and gasket. If that didn't do the trick, then we'd have to remove the unit. Well, that's easy. Now, how would you go about checking for fluid leaks, Hal? Well, Wes, the first thing I'd do would be to check the hydraulic line connections, the master cylinder, and the wheel cylinders for leaks. If these points check out okay, then you can start suspecting the power unit. Right. And you might check the gaskets and O-ring at the end plugs in the main cylinder and valve housing for leakage. In addition, there are two small O-rings in the valve housing face that's attached to the main housing. If tightening the four attaching screws doesn't stop the leak, then you'd have to replace the rings. Tell Wes about fluid getting into the main housing, Hal. Right, Tech. 
If you're losing fluid from the system and there aren't any external leaks, you can suspect a leak around the diaphragm pushrod. And that means you'll have to take the unit off the car and repair it on the bench. You can make a quick check for this type of leak by removing the housing clamp and lifting the diaphragm out of its groove. If you find fluid in the cylinder side of the housing, it's probably due to a worn primary cup and O-ring in the pushrod bearing and the return system seal. When you check for this, be sure to examine the push rod for deep scratches or score marks. Any other tips on leaks? Tell them about that condition at the main cylinder flange gasket, Hal. Right. You see, Wes, if the return system check valve is assembled wrong, fluid that bypassed a worn primary cup would be under pressure. The fluid would not be able to return to the master cylinder, so it would leak past the main cylinder flange gasket and out on the ground. Well, what's the correction for this, Hal? You'd have to replace the leaking seal and gasket and either repair or replace the return system check valve, Wes. Actually, your best bet to take care of this type of leak is to replace worn parts with the replacement kit, which contains all of the necessary rubber parts. And remember, Wes, the small end of the return system check valve ball spring has to be against the ball. Also, be careful not to get dirt into the system or you're in for trouble. There's one other point, Wes. If you're sure that the unit isn't performing right because of possible leaks at the vacuum or air valves in the valve housing, replace the complete valve housing unit as an assembly. And don't attempt to repair the valves. They're calibrated during production, and you can't change them. Well, that about wraps up the story on power brakes. However, there's plenty more about these brakes in this reference book. You got anything else to say, Tech? I've always got something to say. First of all, this is a mighty fine power brake, the best in the industry. So it's up to you, Wes, and every other mechanic to see that the customer gets the finest brake service you can give him. Remember, it's the customer that lays that golden egg called service business. And if you want some of those eggs in your pay envelope, you'd better give him good service.